Time keeps on leaving and we keep on moving. When do we pass on our wisdom to the youth? My veteran story, lost ours discussions, fireside chats with the bourbon or two. It's time to hear the stories by our military veterans. Get yourself ready. It's the Lost Arts Podcast. The Lost Arts with Andrew Cox. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Lost Art Podcast. That podcast giving a voice to our veterans. On today's episode, we have one of the regulars, Aaron Davis, Mass Art retired Marine superstar, going to come on here, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about his career, places he's been, things he's done. Just like everybody else when they come on and do a My Veteran Story. So I'm looking forward to it. But if you're enjoying the podcast, then be sure to go to the website. That's thelostart.podbean.com. You can go on there. There's a merchandise tab. You can click on that. Uh, go in there. Get you a hat. Get you a shirt. Get you something. A mug. Coffee cup. Something like that. Uh, help support the podcast. And getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. All right. With that, Aaron, how you doing? Doing good. Nice, you, you nice surviving? day for Mother's Day. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Yeah, we got we got a good day for Mother's Day. Yeah, I hope you that, uh, took care of uh, of Mama and uh, made sure she was good, and then took care of the wife, and then took care of all the other mamas in your life. Well, yeah. Well, wife, yes. My my mom is uh, is in in Arkansas, uh, and obviously, as you know, I, I retired to Florida. Yeah. So. But yeah, she's being taken care of. I, I thank my stepdad for doing that. Nice. Uh, nice. But yeah, well, all good. is all is well in the world. That's right. That's right. Well, we're here to uh, talk about your uh, uh, veteran story. So I'm I'm excited. I, I know parts of your story. I don't know all of it though. So I'm excited to hear the rest of it. Uh, so take us back. Uh, you obviously grew up in Arkansas. So tell us what growing up in Arkansas was like. And then also kind of what led you into uh, the military? So, uh, so growing up, I, uh, I moved around a little bit. Uh, my mom was married a couple of times, so I didn't, I didn't live with her my whole childhood growing up. Um, lived with my grandmother, actually both grandmothers, uh, on my father's side and my mother's side a little bit. Uh, lived with my mom a little bit as well. Uh, graduated high school. I was, I was living with my mother. And, uh, so I'll kind of start there. Uh, I guess I was about 15, maybe going on 16. I don't think I was driving yet. And that's when I've seen my first Marine recruiter in the, in the high school. And I started thinking, uh, maybe that's something I want to do. My grandfather was a Marine on my, on my mom's side. Uh, a couple of his brothers were Marines as well. So like family reunions growing up, I would see the photos at my grandma, great grandmother's house yeah. of, of all the boys, you know, their, their boot camp photos and stuff like that. And, uh, one in particular, my uncle Raymond, uh, he was a Marine. He was in, in, uh, Bravo one, one, but he, he, uh, was killed in, in Vietnam in 1967. Oh, wow. So, but his photo was just stood out to me because I, I kind of favored him, I guess, appearance wise a little yeah. bit. Um, and well, I thought so anyway, but I remember family reunions. I was just looking at him just being all of, of his Marine photo, you know? Mm -hmm. So high school rolls around. I see the Marine recruiter in, in, uh, in my high school recruit, actually recruiting one of my neighbors, uh, kind of lived back behind me a little bit. And right. the recruiter would come over and play basketball with us on the weekend. So I just, it was real, he was real competitive. So I, you know, I was a competitive. I was, you know, played sports and, and just growing up as a kid. And I was like, man, this is something I might want to do. So. Right. I think I was 17. Uh, and recruiter contacted me, of course, and was like, Hey, you know, did the whole spill. What do you, what do you think about joining the Marines? Da, da, da. And uh, I was like, yeah, let's, let's give this thing a shot. Uh, obviously 17, I had to get my, my parents' signature and they were all for it. <laughs> nice, <laughs> they were like, nice. can you, can you take him today? Uh, 
I, I wasn't like a, a bad kid or anything like that. It's just, you know, rambunctious, I guess you could say. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, funny. yeah, signed up as early as I could, went the late entry program. Um, uh, mm-hmm. and let's see, that was, I guess, 19, 1997. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. 1998. So I was in delayed entry. Yeah, delayed entry program for about a year, just shy of oh, a wow. year, and then I shipped to boot camp in uh, June second. Actually, it was it was really on June first, but we were kind of delayed, so we but I arrived there on June second, 1999. Okay. Wow. Uh, so got to boot camp and picked up with uh, the follow series of Fox Company. Uh, second battalion, yeah. <laughs> uh, platoon 2070, so 2070. Okay. Senior drone instructor, Staff Sergeant Weiss. I think he ended up retiring as a Sergeant Major after 30 years, yeah. Sergeant Major Weiss. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I definitely know yeah. that name for sure. But that's pretty much how I got started my career. I, th- I think, you know, er- kind of early on, I felt that I wanted to be a Marine. Uh, I wanted to do something with the military. Right. Uh and I figured Marine was the was the way to go since my grandfather was a Marine and several of his brothers were. A couple of them were in the Army too, but you know, why not why not be and why not go for the best, right? That's right. Uh so uh, when you talk about uh uh family members being in the Marine Corps, that's a, a huge portion of Marines that come in. It's because they had a family member that was in the Marine Corps and they wanted to do the same type of deal, which is really neat. So but it really is a big family, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I didn't, my grandfather didn't tell a whole lot of stories, you know, about, about the Marine Corps. I, yeah. No, I'm sure I was kind of privy to them going to family reunions and unions and they would talk about it and stuff like that. But, you know, it wasn't like a topic of discussion all the time. Right. So I didn't really know a whole lot. Like, you know, there's some folks out there that, you know, like you said, they come from a, a, a lineage of long line of Marines and, and a lot of them yeah. know whether it was their father, grandfather, or whatever, they know what they did and this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. But I, I was still, I was still curious. It was one of those, you know, whether they chose to tell me or not, uh, right. you know, I don't know. I didn't really ask. Uh, I was just kind of going in, into it, you know, kind of open-minded. Yeah. And then, uh, so when you joined up, what, uh, what, uh, MOS were you joining with? So, uh, <laughs> probably could have picked just about any MOS, but I, I wanted to be a grunt. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, three, okay. put me in the infantry. And they're like, you sure? You sure? I just remember my recruiter. You sure that's what you want to do? I was like, yep. Make me a grunt. <laughs> uh, so I came in with an O three open contract. Um, and, and uh, had really no thought about being anything else other other than infantry marine, uh, right? And uh, ended up getting awarded O three forty one mortarman. Okay, mortarman. Yeah. Uh, so after went through boot camp, uh, while I was in boot camp, my stepfather passed away. So I, you know, when I first got to boot camp, I was just you know. General population, right? Not a team right. leader, not a squad leader. Just, I didn't, I wouldn't say I was going through the motions, right? We're all kind of going through the motions because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, but I didn't find it like over overbearingly hard or anything like that. You know, people would tell me before I ship, hey, it's going to be tough. Right. It's going to be the hardest thing. I didn't really think so, uh, but it wasn't easy. That's for dang sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I went home on emergency leave. I think I was three weeks into boot camp. Yeah, get about three oh, wow. weeks. Um, and my leadership and you know, senior drone instructor, you know, all the way up to I think I believe company no series commander. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Had talked to me and said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna let you go home on emergency leave, um, but you may end up getting dropped to the next company, right, for missing oh, wow. too many training days." you know, depending on how long you're gone. So, uh, I think initially I was going to be gone for three days or something like that, but I got a, caught a weather delay on the way back. So I was gone for four days. When I first got back, 
jumped in, you know, right in, got back, jumped in the platoon, got in my normal position. Uh, I think it was like basically middle of the platoon. I think that we, I think we had about 80 recruits in my platoon, something like that, give or take. That sounds right. Yeah. Uh, and next thing you know, a senior drill instructor is yelling at me to come back up to the, <laughs> to the, to the deck. And I thought I was fixing to get smoked on the quarter deck. <laughs> and I go up there and he's like, Hey, you're going to go talk to the series commander. Well, he, I mean, they did the, the normal leadership thing. How are things? How's your mom? All right. Yeah. You know, kind of, it, it was kind of throwing me off a little bit because, you know, <laughs> we were used to getting yelled at and they were talking to me like a normal human being. So I was like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where is this thing going? You know, I was kind of confused. And he's like, you're going to go see the series commander. So I went and talked to the series commander. And while I was talking to him, he said, we're going to keep you in training on request of your senior drill instructor. Oh, very so nice. He's like, Hey, Roger that. You know, I obviously I didn't say Roger that. I was like, yeah, I, yeah, sir. yeah. You know, I sir. <laughs> so he dismissed me, went back to the platoon, fell back into the platoon. They faced us to the right. Senior drone sir said, Davis, get in front of second squad. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so he Very just nice. he made me a he made me a squad leader right off the bat. <laughs> Later I found out my recruiter had called and talked to the senior drone instructor and requested Hey, if you get an opportunity to put him in a leadership position and put him in it. Oh, wow. That's so really cool. I guess immediately he was like, make me make him a squad leader. And I remained a squad leader the rest of the boot camp. So no kidding. Wow. That's so awesome. that, that was kind of my introduction to Marine Corps leadership, if you will. Right. We're all, we all get leadership training, but it was like feed them to the wolves, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very uh, true. I remember spending just about every day on the quarter deck, two or three times a day. Because if a recruit in my squad screwed up, guess what? I got it too. <laughs> it sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I infantry right off the bat. Uh, I was meritorious PFC out of boot camp for being a nice. squad leader. So I, was, yeah. I wasn't a contract PFC or nothing like that. I started out as a private. Uh, Got to SOI. As soon as I get to SOI, I went on like the camp guard there for it was about a, I guess it was about a month, little little shy of a month. Okay, but basically the you know how they have the privates and PFCs when they if they check in early they put them on like camp guard, standing fire watch, standing posts oh, yeah. all around the the SOI area. So this is West Coast, by the way. I guess I should back up MCRD San Diego and then yeah, and then sure. up to. Uh, uh, honor free for yeah, SOI. Johnson, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, now when so you I went up that, there, were the, uh, the old, squ uh, constant hut still there? Yes. There was still, a handful of Quonset huts there. We did not, obviously we, we were in barracks. Um, they had just built, if I remember correctly, we were in the old squad base. Yeah. Uh, but they just built a new barracks maybe the year before. Oh, excuse me. Um, but I remember they were putting MCT kids in those barracks because MCT kids would come in and they would be in there for a few days and they would go out, do their training, and then come back. I think MCT was like a few weeks Yeah, yeah at yeah, that yeah. point in time, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um. But so they weren't staying there very long, you know, to, to wreck the barracks, if you will. Yeah. Uh, in SOI, we were in squad base because we were, you know, in and out. Obviously, we would go out to the field and train, but on the weekends, we were in, in the squad base and stuff like that. But uh, somehow managed to become a squad leader for the 41s uh, through, through SOI, through my yeah. 0311 training. Uh, well, while I was there, that's when I got, they came and did my, clearance for yankee white what they call yankee white so security clearance to go to eighth and to go to marine yeah, eighth and i yeah, yeah. That, that, so i was gonna say explain that to everybody because not everybody knows what that is but yeah well let me back up a little bit so boot camp is when they they kind of started asking they got us all in 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 the room and they started asking a series of questions hey 0311 or if you're if you're 03 step forward if you're six foot or over, step step forward. And I'm five foot eleven, 
but my senior drill instructor was standing there and he goes, Davis, what are you doing? Uh, I, I'm not six foot. He goes, I don't care. Get up there. He literally <laughs> walked me up to the first sergeant uh, from Bravo company, eighth and I, and you know, the first sergeant's like, are you six foot? I was like, no. Nope. And he goes, can you march? And the senior drill instructor's like, yep. <laughs> so, uh, they kind of just threw me at it. But while I was at SOY is when they finally came down and said, Hey, you're Yankee white cleared. You're no longer going to be a 0341. You're going to be a 0311. So basically changed me from a 41. I didn't, I ended up not going to weapons company to get my mortarman training. Oh, wow. So you just did the 0311 package. So I just did the 0311 package. Um, uh, and then ended up getting orders to Marine barracks eighth and nine. Literally, it happened within a few days, and then we graduated okay. SOI, and I was on a plane to 8th and I. I changed out of my alphas at the airport, thought I was going to get to Washington Reagan. We were going to chill out for a few days before we had to report, <laughs> you know, and this was pre-9-11, so yeah. people could meet you at the terminal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get off the airplane, and, and you know, we got the boot tan line around our heads you could tell we were just dirty grunts right in, in civilian attire i love it and uh the staff sergeant and i think it was a sergeant and a corporal met us as soon as we walked off the terminal what are you doing you know started yelling at us again we we're like oh <laughs> crap we here we are thought we were slick marines right and yeah. <laughs> we come from walking off there and they're gathering us up and grabbed all of our, our bags and oh, put us on a bus and here we thought we were going to boot camp again we were just like what in the world is going on you know <laughs> and of course they're yelling at us and stuff like that and so we get to eighth and i they get us get us off the bus and uh put us in one of the 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 barracks towers there they're, yeah. kind of, they're in a different location now i guess from from what i'm told i haven't been back there in a long time actually i haven't been back to eighth and i since 2003 so well it, it's probably it, time to take across, a trip kind of across the street from the barracks and then uh there was the chow hall and then the high yes. rise there yeah yep 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 yeah, so I, bravo company was in the so if you're looking at the one where alpha company is the the barracks with the chow hall in it to the mm -hmm. left-handed side was the Bravo Company, and that's the one we, they marched us into, um, or filed us into. I wouldn't say marched us into there, but um, I remember us getting there. They lined us up, and I guess, you know, kind of trying to figure out which platoon we were going to go to, so on and so forth. Uh, right. We had to go through ceremonial drill school first, but they mm -hmm. first got us in there. They turned face you know about face face the wall while the silent drill team had to come in they didn't want us looking at them <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't but it was, to look at them <laughs> yeah we didn't write to look at them yet but it was it, it was different it was definitely different um you know all ceremonial you know it was about bearing uh, discipline uh you know just basically being the best because yeah. you are you are in the eye of the public there. That's a lot of people. That's that's all they see of the Marine Corps is eighth and I. You know that's right. And so you kind of set the example. That the barracks there is literally in the heart of DC. I mean, it's just just down yes. the road from the Capitol yeah, and all that yep. stuff, right? But um, uh, and I want to say about a mile wrong, and a half or something like that. Yeah, a mile and a half. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, and and that's the only the commandant's house. Uh, was the only thing that survived back in the day when everything got burnt, right? Yep. Yep. They, uh, they saved the commandant's house out of respect for the Marines who basically 300 Marines defended against the British. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, uh, awesome. I don't remember the exact history on that, but it was just, it was, I think, I believe it was just over 300 Marines had defended against Marines and sailors, I should say, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, from, you know, sailors from the Washington Navy yard there. Mm -hmm. uh defended uh, basically dc against the british yeah um but, i mean they burned down the white yeah, house too yeah they they basically yeah. set dc on fire um mm -hmm. <laughs> except for the commandant's house yep yeah that's pretty wild 
So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what were your duties like at 8th and I? What all did you do while you were there? Uh, and and just kind of walk us through that. So when when I first got there, so you get you go through ceremonial drill school. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, uh, some some kids, you know, some young Marines go there to be body bearers, right? It, obviously, the bigger, stronger kids. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I was. I think I was 150 pounds sopping wet, so I was. There was no so chance I was going to be a body. Not. Yeah, <laughs> there was no chance I was going to be a body bearer. Uh, but everybody goes through ceremonial drill school, uh, and, it, and and it's different drill. Uh, it's it's you know more traditional, you know eighteen mm-hmm. hundreds drill, more aligned with that than than you know modern day drill that that kids go through boot camp. So you basically everything you learn through boot camp, you got to get rid of. Yeah. It's a lot different. Um, the basics are still the same. Uh, commands are called on different foots. It's again. You know, ceremonial honor guard drill basically is is what it is. So you basically go through that all over again for about, I want to say when I was there, I think it was about two months, about a month and a half to two months. Yeah. Two months. Yeah. I, I, so I got time. there. Actually, I remember we got there Halloween weekend, the weekend of yeah. Halloween. Uh, and, and we kind of got into some trouble <laughs> over the weekend. You went, Liberty, you went trick or treating at the White we, House. Didn't you? We we went to off limits establishments. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Again, I wasn't a perfect Marine. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 are any of us? You know, yeah, that's uh, a good point. Yeah. So we get you know young Marines get curious and they try to investigate things and find out what's what's this place. You know, yeah. so we didn't get in trouble in, in, you know, with civil authorities, you know, uh, it was when we came back on the weekend, we got woke up at zero five on Monday morning and we still had the stamp of the club. We weren't supposed to be in on our, on our hand. <laughs> so we went on a little run uh, and paid for that one. But yeah, so we were there. Uh, so that was Halloween weekend and we graduated ceremonial drill school. I want to say like the middle of December, right before the Christmas, because I got my, I got to my platoon Bravo company, first platoon right before the Christmas holidays. Cause we went, we immediately like went on Christmas leave after we got to the platoon. Um, and then right after the holidays, right after new year's, uh, in January, and I can't remember the date offhand. I'm sure somebody could Google this and figure it out. But we, uh, <laughs> I got exposed to my first funeral with snow on the ground. It was General Chapman's funeral. General Chapman oh, wow. was commandant, uh, yeah, around the Vietnam era, but um, around that time. But he, uh, he had passed away, and we conducted his, you know, full on four star general funeral. So this is, you know, a massive uh, so- funeral escort. You're talking. He gets the full band. Uh, yeah, he gets the full. The, the full. He gets the case on. Yeah, uh, the case on everything. Four, four platoons. Uh, yes, I believe it was four. Two, two Alpha Company, two Bravo Company platoons. Uh, the Colonel, the the Marine uh, Barracks Commanding Officer, yep. uh, is the parade as is the funeral escort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they get the whole shebang, and we were. I mean, there was snow on the ground. It was freezing. <laughs> and that was my exposure to my first full honors funeral. Uh, but it was it was awesome. It was a great feeling. Uh, yeah. It was like, man, you, this is a prestigious post in the Marine Corps. Um, you know, so that was kind of my eye opener to, to my next three years because I spent my entire first enlistment at, at Marine Barracks 8 to 9. Wow. So, uh, how many uh, funerals, uh, funeral details do you figure you have been on? Uh, I would say in the hundreds. Uh, I, I, you know, I never kept count. Some folks kept count of them, but probably several hundred. Uh, you know, whether it be uh, full honors funerals or or just your standard uh, firing party with your with your 21 gun salute and the body bearers, typically we we'd go out on standard funeral details around the, the national capital right. region. Um, so if you count so you all have, those included, probably two to 300. Wow. That's yeah. pretty wild. 
the uh, so as a rifle bearer uh, uh, or rifle party member, uh, how much practice did you have to do to get the volleys together? Uh, a ton. <laughs> it's uh, you you practice and you practice some more and you practice some more and you practice some more. It's uh, and it's and it's like you know you take baby steps going into it. Um, yeah. And, and they don't just pick just any Marine can be on that firing party. Right. You know, it's obviously you have to be good at drill, right? Cause you know, you're a small unit eyes are on you, especially the standard funerals, because the last typically the body bearers motto is the last to let you down. So they're carrying right. the caskets and, and they're folding the flags and, and uh, presenting the colors to, to the, uh, to the family members. And between them and the firing party for a standard funeral, that's and and of course uh, taps paid played by a bugler. That's literally the last thing some families ever see of, of the Marine Corps. Yeah, um, and and the last thing that's on their mind once they've lost, you know, they've put their lost one or their loved one to to rest. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's it's a very prestigious billet to be on that firing party. Um, so the way they start it is obviously they get the best seven, what we call trigger pullers, right? <laughs> best, <laughs> best seven trigger pullers that we can get. Obviously you have yeah. to work together as a, as a tight knit group. Um, and you have to be able to read each other. Um, mm -hmm. and you start off literally by dry firing the weapons, start getting into a rhythm and they, they do yeah. counts, right? Um, and, and, once everybody can get into the rhythm, then they go with the blank rounds. And then we, where we used to do our rehearsals at down at the Washington Navy Yard, uh, we called it the docks, right? Basically yeah. the old docks at the, at the Washington Navy Yard is where we do our dry, uh, our dry runs at, uh, for practice. And we would, we would show up at zero four zero four thirty. As soon as they could get the armory open, we would yeah. draw weapons out and go prepare for, for that day. Wow. But just the practice working up to that point, because another thing a lot of people don't know is they alternate the firing parties between Alpha Company and Bravo Company every year for the for the Tuesday uh, sunset parades at the at the Iwo Jima Memorial. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so they alternate every year. So I don't know if they still do it, but they did it that way back then. Is mm -hmm. Alpha Company would have it one year, the next year would be Bravo Company. So, but it would be like a competition. Whoever had. Yeah. Whichever platoon had the best firing party, and they would compete, and you know, compete across the the company, and they would get picked to be the, represent that company, and then eventually, obviously, the 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 barracks for yeah. that firing party for that year. Um, so it was very very competitive. So, something to be said about competition. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's one of the things that uh, the Marine Corps, I think, does really well at, uh, and the military yeah. in general. Uh, but uh, I mean, I think the Marine Corps takes it to a whole new level most of the time, so uh, yeah. it definitely raises the bar. You know, it just keeps going up and up and up, yeah. And it's and it's to me, it's it's very similar to sports, too. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to give it your best, right? But maybe yeah. you're having maybe you're you're in a slump, according you know, as you know, I love baseball. Maybe yeah. you're in a maybe you're in a hitting slump. Maybe you're in a firing party slump. Right? You can be yeah. replaced. <laughs> you can you can easily be replaced by somebody that's that's doing good because you you typically have a couple of alternates just in case yeah. somebody you know goes down. But yeah, it's uh de definitely definitely some good memories. I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. And then you spent how how many years there at uh, Eighth and I? So I got, uh, I was there from 1999 to 2003. Uh, okay. I can't remember the date, but I, I marched my last uh, ceremony in June of 2003. I can't remember the exact date, but. Wow. And then where to after that, where did you uh, get shipped off to? So uh, I actually got out of the Marine Corps okay. uh, in July. July was my EAS of 2003. I went on terminal in June. Um, so got out in July, EAS in July of 2003, ended up going back to Arkansas and I started working as a, uh, 
basically as a manager trainee at a restaurant that I worked at before I joined. So through high school and then before I joined, I worked at this restaurant and, uh, the, uh, owner, owner, general manager, well, his family owned, owned the restaurants at the time. And he was the general manager, good friends, uh, with him. Uh, and I, you know, he was looking to make me an assistant manager in the restaurant business. And I was looking forward to it and, uh, started training, ended up becoming, uh, assistant manager of, uh, the restaurant was Western Sizzling. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. They're kind, of, yeah. they're kind of a chain of uh, Great American Steak Buffet, Western Sizzlings, uh, that I type of stuff. But anyway, the, so the Western Sizzling in Arkadelphia I became assistant manager of uh, okay. and worked there for a little while and ended up, I was married to my first wife at the time. We ended up going through a divorce and I ended up leaving the restaurant business and went into a corrugated paper product manufacturing company, uh, which, which was interesting. It was very hard work. <laughs> where, where was um, that at? That was in Bryant, Arkansas. The name of the place was J and S manufacturing. Um, okay. great people, uh, family oriented. Uh, yeah, just awesome co-workers that I worked with there. Uh, still friends with them to this day. Um, but I ended up when I, well, let me back up a little bit. Right before I went to work with them, I joined the Army National Guard. Mm. Uh, I missed the military. So I was like, I had had a guy, uh, I believe is a first sergeant in the Army National Guard at the time. Former, He was a former Marine. Mm-hmm. And he was kind of sort of recruiting me, trying to talk me into joining the yeah. National Guard there in Arkansas. And uh, I was like, well, I guess I guess I'll give this a shot. So I said, sign me up. I uh, had to pick an MOS. But the way the National Guard works is they basically fill billets. So, like, you can't just go in. I mean, I guess you could go in open contract. and They just put you wherever they want. Yeah. But being prior military and being a sergeant in the Marine Corps and I was coming in as a sergeant, they had to find a billet for me. So the billet they had was a unit supply specialist at an aviation brigade. Oh, wow. So right there, right there in North Little Rock, in Camp Robinson, uh, I believe at the time it was 35th Aviation Brigade, okay. uh, HHC, which is headquarters, headquarters company. Mm-hmm. And believe now they are known as 77th. Well, they changed their name, realigned their, their units and, and colors and names. Uh, 77th Aviation or Theater Aviation Brigade now, I believe, is what it is. Okay. Um, but I, I went to be a unit supply specialist for them, but it took them two years to get me into an MOS school to become qualified for unit supply. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> well, you were doing the job though. You well, I was doing the job. Yeah. Uh, I was doing the job. I was doing several other things to include kind of marksmanship training for the unit. Yeah. Uh, kind of uh, environmental, I can't even remember what it's called now. Environmental compliance officer. Mm-hmm. I went to school for that. I had to go through a transportation of hazardous materials course. Oh, wow. Uh, several other courses. So base, basically, so like units are out in the field and they're training, right? Let's say mm-hmm. they have a spill. I have to basically, as the unit representative, have to make sure that we control that spill and right. take care yeah. of the environment and all that. Make sure we're not littering, leaving trash and all kinds of stuff behind. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Basic leadership stuff in the Marine Corps. The, the yeah. Army's a little bit different. They have They have a soldier for everything. <laughs> but soldier forever pretty much uh it's collateral <laughs> it's collateral duties i was it was unit supply but yeah you know, collateral duty um so i did that for a couple of years uh and then had a had a friend that was killed in iraq one of my former marines actually a good friend of mine um from when I left eighth and I, he ended up going to the fleet. But anyway, he was, he was killed in Iraq. Had a couple of other buddies that was at eighth and I with was killed in Iraq. And I was like, man, I'm, I miss the Marine Corps. I'm, I miss the camaraderie. 
Uh, the yeah. army is definitely not the same. Uh, so I called my uh, my original recruiter. I think he was a mass sergeant at the time, and I said, "Hey, what would it do to get you know what will it take to get me back in the Marine Corps?" So that let me back up a little bit. So that was I was in Army National Guard from 2004 to 2006. Okay, so a couple of years there, and um, he said, "Well, here's here's." Master Gun Sergeant Walker, contact him. He'll put you in contact with a recruiter. We'll see, see if they can get you back in. Mm-hmm. So I called him. Uh, I don't remember the timeline, but ended up having to go on the recruiting station, went to MEPS, filled out my paperwork and all that. I did a phone interview with a uh, Master Sergeant that was at, at Headquarters Marine Corps. Um, I, know, I can't remember his name right now, but he did a phone interview with me for the 0511 MOS. Uh, and there, and I picked two other MOSs to come back in as, uh, and they said, well, it can take six months to a year to for everybody. Uh, 0511 is enlisted MAGTAF planner or MAGTAF planning specialists. Um, uh, basically we work with the officer planners, uh, within the, the plans and operations sections, uh, at headquarters units across the Marine Corps to uh, basically develop and, and uh, build plans. Uh, more specifically, we deal with a system called Joint Operation Planning and Execution System, JOPES. Yeah. Um, to basically manage the, the, the flow and movement of forces. So basically, it's also known as Force Deployment Planning and, Ex- and Execution, FDP and E. Uh, so that's what the enlisted planner does. Um, and then you had to, uh, you said they did an interview uh, for you to come back into that MOS. Yeah. So coming back in the Marine Corps, they, they're like, you know, pick three MOSs, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I said infantry and they said, nope, it's closed. So oh. infantry was closed. So I couldn't come back in uh, as O three. 3 pe- Pick three more. So I picked... Uh, I believe one was air traffic controller, CH-53 crew chief, which those guys have to go become mechanics first, basically. So they have to yeah. go to the maintenance school and then become crew chiefs once they get their, you know, their time in, so on and so forth. Right, right. Um, but it was a couple of MOSs that were open that I thought might be inter- interesting. And they're like, well, here's another one, 0511. We got openings for that one. Uh, openings meaning that they have – uh, billet spaces across the Marine Corps that they need to fill. Right. So I said, what do they do? And they, one guy told me, he said, uh, they called up a guy at RS Oklahoma city, uh, eighth Marine Corps district headquarters at that time. And they said, uh, well, they work in the three shop at skate three shop, meaning operations section. And there's not one three section, or operations section across the Marine Corps that skate. I didn't know that at the time. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, fooled me once, but I wanted to be back in the Marine Corps. So fooled me again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Beggars can't be choosers. Right. (laughs) So uh, again, got that phone interview. uh, And they asked, asked me, you know, a few things about reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, Can you work? Can you uh, operate a computer system? I said, yeah, I can turn it on. I can type some emails and I can surf the interwebs, you know. <laughs> I know the basics about using a computer. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess that was good enough for them. Plus, I already had my security clearance. So, I think that was the, oh, the major. So, to oh, lap move, so, yeah. yeah. So, to lap move into RMOS in the Marine Corps, you have to be – now you have to uh, be eligible for a top secret security clearance. Oh, wow. So you already have to possess a secret and then you have to be eligible for, for a top secret. Oh, um, yeah. At that time, it was just secret. And I believe, I believe I still had my top secret from when I was at eighth and I. Yeah. But the way the top secret works. So really you're, you're, you're TS eligible but you only get granted your SCI once you get read into whatever you're going to deal with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how it works. You're eligible for, for the, for the clearance, 
but you don't actually hold it unless you need it. Right. Um, anyway, all that to be said, came back in as 0511 and got to my first duty station in you know, February, March, March of 2007, which was uh, 2MAF, uh, so 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. So you're with the headquarters? So I was with the headquarters, worked in the G3 uh, for three years there, uh, deployed to Iraq in 2009 with them. Where did you go? Uh, you went with them? Uh, went to Al Assad. So Al -Assad. I just went, yeah, some people called it Camp Cupcake, whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I did a year long was deployment. It, so Al Assad had the pool, right? They, they did. I never yeah. attended the pool, just. You know, for no, whoever's I'm, taking notes, I did not attend the pool. I was pretty <laughs> busy. I stayed pretty busy. Yeah, you probably yeah, were. Give me, give me one second. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. Had a. Had a had a couple visitors. My dogs decided to join me in the in the office room here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just never attended the pool. We we did we did some uh, kind of competitive CrossFit uh, physical training events on the yeah. weekends there. Uh, but for the most part, I, I I never went to the pool. I rarely went to the gym. I was always an outside P tier. I love oh, being outside. And, Again, yeah. I mean, I was a kid that wanted to go, wanted to go into the infantry. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed the outdoors and and loved getting dirty and and all that. Um, so it was kind of kind of unusual working in a in a headquarters in a in an office space for the, I guess at that time, so two thousand nine. I retired in twenty twenty two, so I didn't realize the next thirteen to fourteen years was going to be office jobs <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so what, what types of things uh were you doing on your deployment i know you say office jobs but uh you're just basically making plans for the math yeah they so that doing different things yeah so that's what i did i i um uh, basically managed i was i was the chief of force deployment plan and execution system under under the two math g3 so i deployed to be the the, um, the chief for that actually when I so when I was getting ready to deploy I was a sergeant and I got selected this staff sergeant uh, oh, and okay. then I ended up during the deployment is when I pinned on staff sergeant um, nice so that that was good and it, and that billet is usually a, a gunnery sergeant or a mass sergeant it's a meth level oh, it's, wow. a, it's a mass sergeant yeah usually the plans chief is a mass sergeant and the force deployment chief is the is the uh the gunny okay so yeah i got i got to go do that as a brand new staff sergeant um did that for uh so i deployed to iraq in january of 2009 and redeployed from iraq in january of 2010 okay uh now, you came back do you stay at 2 math so i was at 2 math until uh, I was thinking the timeline here. Um, in March, April, until April of 2010, and I received orders to. Uh, well, actually, I knew I was getting orders a little bit earlier, but I got orders to uh, drone instructor school at uh, Paris Island, South Carolina. So I executed orders there, but I was only there a couple of months and ended up getting dropped medically. And ended up going back to 2 Mef, and I stayed at 2 Mef until uh, September, I believe it was September of 2010. Okay. And then uh, September of 2010, I ended up going to 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit, so 24th Mew, I'm right there yep. out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Um, I didn't realize you spent that much time there. I was there for six years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like that place. I like that whole area, but 
Well, I mean, as you know, a lot of people, you know, they homestead. Um, mm-hmm. But the way our MOS works and our career works, it's better if you – because remember, I went straight to a MEF as a sergeant, so I yeah. didn't get to experience lower-level units as a mm-hmm. junior Marine, and I went straight up to a higher level. Now, junior Marines can go to the higher level, but to gain the more experience and knowledge within, within that uh, MOS mm-hmm. – it, it's best if you are able to go to every different type of unit and to yeah, include the smaller way up current kind of work your way up. Yeah. Um, so as a staff sergeant though, that's kind of your last opportunity to go to a regimental, a mew level, uh, or, or even sometimes an MSC. Now the chiefs at the MSCs, uh, MSCs major subordinate command, which are like mm-hmm. division, Marine Logistics Group and the Marine Air Wing, right? Those are gunnies, but as a staff sergeant, you, you better get it in fast if you haven't been there because you could get promoted to gunny within three years of being a staff sergeant. So, yeah. Uh, in, in the 0511 community. So, I, I wanted to go to a regiment or a MU, and lo and behold, a MU was available. So, I ended up going on a Marine Expeditionary Unit. Uh, which was probably my best favorite. I would probably do it over. I would homestead on a Mew. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, I loved, absolutely loved the Mew because they're, they're always busy. They're always yeah. doing something. Right. And I'm just one of those. It's like, as long as I'm doing something, I'm good. Yeah. It's when yeah, I yeah, yeah. Set, have time to sit around and not do anything at all is when it just, Either I get in trouble or life just becomes horrible, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That's funny. So, But, yeah, I ended up doing a, a Fleet Week New York, which was awesome uh, on that Mew. Yeah. Uh, we did a deployment to – we did a few exercises, did um, African line exercise in, in Morocco yeah. on that deployment. Uh Ended up a couple. I didn't get to stop. Well, I stopped in in Rota, Spain, but that was my only Europe stop. Uh, couple, the other ships made a couple of port visits within Europe. Um, oh, wow. So that was good for them. But we ended up going straight into the CENTCOM area of operations and we did an Eager Lion exercise, uh, which is in Jordan. Yeah. Uh, we did that. We. Uh, the Mew itself didn't participate, but we they used our ship and some of our assets for some anti-piracy operations, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you get to shoot the we, guns at them and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, that, that was fun to say the least, but, <laughs> uh, that, again, operations, man, that's, that's where it's at. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you join for a reason, right? <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah. And that's to do things. Um, but my last, I'd say three months, so August of 2012 until end of October of 2012. So yeah. So beginning of August, I would say, to the end of October. So three months inclusive. Uh-huh. I went to uh, off the Horn of Africa, and we did. We did training ashore, which was really sustainment training for the for the Mew elements. Yeah, um, and I got to do a lot of basically infantry training. Uh, nice. While while we were ashore there for three months, now it was off and on. Like we didn't stay out in the field for three months straight. We would stay yeah. out in the field for a couple of weeks and then come back, get some R and R, rest and refit, pick up another unit. Um, uh, infantry unit from one two one two was our battalion. So that's first. So you were kind of escorting the uh, the different uh, infantry units and kind of. Yeah, well, we were. Stuff. Yeah, we acted as the training and command unit for that for that little small element. It was really just a a, a platoon plus. Yeah. Uh, from the from Bravo Company, uh, first battalion, second Marines, but we we were able to get. I think it was two or three platoons through there through the training. Wow. Which it was just, it was good training. Like, yeah, you know, um, 
really training that they needed. I mean, by this point, we're talking 2012. We were already out of Iraq. We were in Afghanistan, but yeah, Marine units hadn't been doing, you know, basic infantry stuff for a very long time. It was all yeah, that's true. You know, house to house fighting, village to village fighting, uh, mm-hmm. and in the rugged terrain of of Afghanistan. So yeah, but it was all good. Uh, did that for about, like I said, three months, and really enjoyed it. Uh, but my time on the Mew was coming to an end. Uh, I was already in the zone for gunnery sergeant and I was told pick a B billet or B billet will pick you. Uh, and I was actually contemplating uh, making a second attempt at going to be a drill instructor again. Yeah. Uh, I was in, you know, being on the mule, that's the other thing too. You get in great physical shape. Yeah. So I was already in better physical shape uh, prepared for any kind of, you know, Short of having an accident that would medically set me back, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I I, uh, I, w- I was ready to go again, and then my operations officer, who was a a uh, on recruiting, was an OIC on recruiting, sort of talked me into going on recruiting duty. Um, huh? So okay. I was like, okay, well, I guess we'll prepare for this recruiting duty thing. <laughs> and I'd already talked to Sergeant Major Travis. I don't know where he's at in the Marine Corps now, but he he was Sergeant Major of, of the recruiting station in Baton Rouge at the time. Okay. Um, and I'd already communicated with him. Hey, I was looking looking forward to going down there. Uh, but as soon as I got back from that deployment in December, rolled around the next year, the MU started preparations to go on deployment again. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, on a special purpose MAGTAF, AFRICOM. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was looking for orders and I got a phone call and said, hey, where do you want to go next? And I said, well, I've got to go on a B-billet. And it was basically my monitor and my op field sponsor. And they said, no, no, no. Do you want to go to Okinawa or California? And I said, well, <laughs> family wasn't ready to go to Okinawa yet. So, I said, send me to California. Yeah. But I ended up going to 5th Marine Regiment. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so I was looking at my second, uh, I guess you could say, uh, colonel level command yeah. uh, at 5th Marine Regiment. Ended up getting orders there. Uh, that was 2013. Uh, while I was en route executing those orders in, in uh, June of 2013, I got selected to gunnery sergeant. Ah, uh, so, nice. Okay. Yeah, so I arrived there, uh, spent about a year at fifth Marines was preparing to go to special purpose MAGTAV CENTCOM, mm-hmm. uh, that's central command and got another phone call and said, well, we got to move you. Uh, where do you want to, you want, basically they were trying to get me to go to third or I'm sorry, uh, first mall. And no, I'm sorry. That's third mall out there on the West coast. Isn't it? Say, yeah. Third mall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Third mall. I'm sorry. First malls in, in Oki. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they're trying to get me to a third mall, and the Marine Logistics Group billet came open, and that's more of a yes. Third mall is a PCA too, but as you know, there's there's some traffic and a little bit of distance between Camp Pendleton and and uh, uh, yeah. Miramar. <laughs> so, that's no joke. I got so, I got stuck in some of that for sure. Yeah, I was I wasn't looking forward to commuting. Uh, so I said, you know, let's do this, this, uh, first MLG billet, Marine Logistics Group yeah. billet. So I, I jumped on over to, to the first Marine Logistics Group from there as a gunnery sergeant. And that was in, uh, 2014. Okay. Well, Hey, let's, let's, uh, put a pause on it here and we're going to come back. Cause I want you to tell me a little bit about, uh, your experience at fifth Marines and then, okay. uh, moving over to the MLG as well. Uh, all right. All right. So we'll, we'll put a pause there. Uh, the listeners out there, thanks for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying the uh, podcast. Uh, and if you're struggling, you need help, uh, you feel like you were wanting to hurt yourself or something like that, you can always reach out. The VA has some incredible stuff out there. You can always dial 988, press option one. You can also text 939-288, or you can go to veteranscrisisline.net. And you can click on that chat icon. Any of those options are going to give you somebody that's going to be able to help you out. 
And uh, I care about you. Aaron cares about you. The, the entire veteran community cares about you, and we want what's best for you. So please reach out and get some help. Aaron, thanks for coming on. Uh, to all the listeners out there, stay motivated, change your socks.